want to caution everybody out there. If you're somebody who suffers from anxiety or panic attacks and you're not used to ingesting caffeine and you run out and ingest 400 milligrams of caffeine in the form of espresso or yerba mate or an energy drink or in pill form, that is going to be very uncomfortable for you. Dr. Huberman elucidates that caffeine, though a double-edged sword, can't alleviate panic attacks. Instead, proper management involves abstaining. This video unveils caffeine's hidden prowess, demonstrating that in the right dosage, it can unleash your potential. Harness the power of caffeine responsibly and conquer the world with renewed vigor and clarity. However, if you are not caffeine adapted, it will cause vasoconstriction due to an increased stress response. How does caffeine work to make us feel more alert? And does the timing in which we ingest caffeine play an important role in whether or not it works for us or against us? Caffeine is one of the most widely used substances on the planet. Estimates are that more than 90% of adults and as many as 50% of kids, that is adolescents and teenagers, use caffeine on a daily basis. Caffeine is an amazing molecule. Most people are familiar with caffeine's ability to increase alertness and to reduce our feelings of sleepiness and fatigue. Sleepiness goes away when caffeine enters your body and it's important to know why. This video explains the many reasons for caffeine's ability to keep you awake and keep you alert. Discover the secrets of this strong energy booster, this bean juice, and learn to respect its effects. With this understanding, you can use caffeine carefully turning your days into lively and efficient adventures. I know many people are curious as to whether or not caffeine can improve focus and concentration. And indeed, it can. There is an immense amount of data supporting the idea that caffeine, provided it's consumed in the appropriate dosages, can improve mental performance and physical performance. And it largely does that through improvements in focus and concentration. Caffeine is not just a stimulant, caffeine is a reinforcer, and it's a reinforcer that plays an active role in almost everybody's daily life. We can say that with confidence because, as I mentioned a moment ago, more than 90% of people are consuming caffeine, and most people think that they consume caffeine because it makes them feel more alert. But there are many reasons why you're consuming caffeine. Half as much caffeine will give you just as much lift as Twice as much caffeine will give you on a full belly of pasta. And that's just the way that caffeine interacts with blood glucose. The one exception being caffeine. Caffeine's side effects can be anxiety if you ingest too much of it, insomnia if you drink it too late in the day. But typically, it will not cause the major side effects of the other drugs, such as high propensity for addiction and abuse. Caffeine is known to have certain neuroprotective effects, and that is because of its ability to increase neuromodulators such as dopamine, but also other so-called catecholamines like norepinephrine. If you don't know what those names mean, these are molecules that increase levels of alertness, motivation, and drive. And so then, therefore, not surprisingly, the large-scale analyses of the relationship between depression and caffeine shows that provided people are not drinking so much caffeine that it makes them overly anxious, that Regular intake of caffeine is inversely related to levels of depression. So it may have some antidepressant effects and those could be direct or indirect. What do I mean by that? Well, you can imagine that if people are ingesting caffeine and they are more motivated to do work and pursue quality social interactions, then the probability that they will have depression could be lower. It could also be that there are direct effects on the chemical systems of the brain that relate to mood and well-being that could offset depression. It is not clear whether or not the effects of caffeine in countering depression are direct or indirect. Nonetheless, there's a relationship there and it's an interesting and positive one, or I should say negative correlation, positive uh, effect overall on mood and well-being, to be exact. Okay, so caffeine is increasing dopamine's function by changing the number and efficacy of dopamine receptors. But of course, it also increases our wakefulness, our alertness. And that is largely through the neurochemical systems related to adenosine, which is a molecule that builds up in our brain and body the longer we are awake. It's part of the sleepiness system, if you will. It makes us feel fatigued or tired. And caffeine also operates on the epinephrine, the adrenaline system. 
In fact, if we ingest too much caffeine, we'll sometimes get the jitters. Those jitters are really the sympathetic, as it's called, nervous system's bias toward movement. And our pupils will dilate. They actually get broader. Now, somewhat paradoxically, when our pupils get bigger, the pupils of our eyes, that is, our visual world actually narrows. It becomes more tunnel-like. A lot of people don't realize this. When our pupils are really small, that means we are relaxed. So if you ever see someone with really tiny or you know, pin-sized pupils, they're very relaxed. If their pupils are very big, they're very dilated, well, then they are very amped up. They're vi they are very, very alert. Caffeine increases alertness by increasing epinephrine, adrenaline release, both in the brain and within the body. And so that's another way that it facilitates focus and concentration. But to just give you a sense of how caffeine works at the level of its timing and impact on mental performance and physical performance, when we ingest caffeine, provided that we don't have a lot of food in our stomach and that our blood sugar isn't particularly high, generally we experience an increase in alertness within about five minutes. And that increase in focus and alertness peaks around 30 minutes after ingestion of caffeine and persists for as long as 60 minutes. The dosage of caffeine, of course, is going to depend on how caffeine adapted you are, how much caffeine tolerance you have. And that is going to vary tremendously depending on whether or not you ingest that caffeine with or without food, as I mentioned earlier. But there is a kind of general range in which we can talk about caffeine as being useful for focus and concentration. And the range is basically from 100 milligrams to 400 milligrams. I wanna caution everybody out there. If you're somebody who suffers from anxiety or panic attacks, and you're not used to ingesting caffeine and you run out and ingest 400 milligrams of caffeine in the form of espresso or yerba mate or an energy drink or in pill form, that is going to be very uncomfortable for you. You're going to be sweating profusely. Your heart rate is going to increase. You're going to be quite panicked, uh, in fact, or at least anxious. So be cautious with your use and adopting of caffeine if you're not already caffeine adapted. But most people do quite well to ingest 100 to 200 milligrams of caffeine prior to doing some focused work. And again, I recommend delaying your caffeine intake to 90 to 120 minutes after waking, unless you are using that caffeine to really jolt your system uh, before a workout. In fact, most people, when they take their first sip of coffee, they find that it tastes bitter and kind of noxious. They don't like it. You may not even remember that because it happened so long ago and because caffeine is such a strong reinforcer that very quickly you come to like the taste of coffee. You might even come to like the feeling of your mug in your hand. You might even come to like the smell of coffee and so on and so forth. And that's because caffeine stimulates the release of certain neurochemicals in the brain, in particular dopamine and acetylcholine, two neuromodulators that increase our focus and alertness and our feelings of well-being. Caffeine can, of course, be ingested in various forms, even pill form, but most people ingest it in the form of coffee or my particular favorite way to ingest caffeine is yerba mate. Yerba mate or caffeine also have other additional benefits. In particular, the caffeine in yerba mate and coffee and other sources of caffeine are known to increase the density and efficacy, that is the number and the function of dopamine receptors. And this has been shown in humans several times. So by ingesting caffeine pretty regularly, you're actually increasing the ability of dopamine to have this effect of increasing motivation and drive. I tend to ingest caffeine only early in the day. I tend to cut off my caffeine intake somewhere around 1 or 2 p.m. to ensure that I can get into a good night's sleep. But I realize that there are people out there that ingest caffeine as late as 2 or 3 in the afternoon and can still sleep fine. I will caution those of you that think that you can drink caffeine in the evening or nighttime and still fall asleep. All of the research points to the fact that the architecture of your sleep and the depth of your sleep is disrupted even if you're able to fall and stay asleep, the sleep you're getting is simply not as good as the sleep you would get if you were to shut up. Caffeine stimulates the release of dopamine in a way that's very much distinct from the classical dopamine pathway associated with addiction and reward. In fact, we can think of caffeine as having a somewhat privileged access to the reward systems. I'll give you a bit of a hint of where this is going. Caffeine stimulates the release of dopamine and acetylcholine, not within the classic so-called mesolimbic reward pathway. That's just fancy nerd speak for the reward pathways of the brain. They're associated with things like sex and food and drugs of abuse like cocaine and methamphetamine. But rather caffeine seems to stimulate 
the release of dopamine in the parts of the brain that are associated with alertness and cognition, meaning the forebrain. This is very important. We have multiple dopamine systems in the brain and body, and caffeine seems to stimulate dopamine directly within the components of the brain that are associated with clarity of thought and well-being, but more so clarity of thought. Now, I'm also talking about caffeine as a strong reinforcer in that it makes you feel good overall, and it does, and that suggests that it also taps into the more classic reward pathway, but it does that in a very interesting and uh, frankly, almost diabolical way. Why taking it with a double espresso or why taking it with yerba mate would further increase concentration and focus because as I mentioned earlier, caffeine is going to increase epinephrine. It's also going to increase the density of dopamine receptors. When we regularly ingest caffeine, it stimulates the increase in dopamine receptors at multiple sites throughout the brain, but in particular within the reward pathways of the brain. So not the areas of the brain that are associated with focus and clarity of thought and cognition. It does that, but it is also increasing the level of dopamine receptors in the reward pathway. And what that means is that for any dopamine that's released in response to a positive experience, social experience, or any number of the other things that can stimulate dopamine release, there are more receptors, more parking spots, if you will, for that dopamine to arrive at and to exert its increases in mood, increases in motivation, and overall feelings of drive and excitement. So there are four ways that caffeine works that we need to understand. First of all, caffeine acts as a reinforcing agent. It increases the probability that you will return to and engage in a certain activity or consume a certain beverage or food. Second of all, caffeine increases dopamine and acetylcholine, which are both neuromodulators in the forebrain, which helps us improve our ability to think, to modify our rule sets, that is to adjust our strategies for different social situations and mental demands and physical demands. And third, it increases the number and efficacy of dopamine receptors in the reward pathways of the brain. That is, it makes things that would feel pretty good feel even better. And fourth, caffeine acts as an antagonist to adenosine, which offsets the sleepiness that we would otherwise feel from the accumulation of adenosine that occurs as we are awake for more and more hours throughout the day. Even coffee and tea and other forms of caffeine, they tend to make us blink less. And when we get tired, we tend to blink more. Now, this is sort of a duh, right? But being wide-eyed with excitement or fear, or with your eyes barely being able to keep them open, now it should make perfect sense that these shutters on the front of your eyes, they aren't just there for winking and they aren't just there for cosmetic purposes. They are there to regulate the amount of information going into your nervous system. And they're there to regulate how long you are bringing information into your nervous system and in what bins, how widely or finely you are binning time is set by how often you blink and how widely or specifically you are grabbing attention from the visual world is set by whether or not you're viewing things very specifically like a crosshair or through a soda straw view like this or whether or not you are in this panoramic sort of whole environment mode, this kind of fisheye lens or wide angle lens mode. And in fairness to the pharmacology and the circuitry, while dopamine and heightened levels of alertness and excitement tend to make us blink less and attend more. So when we ingest caffeine containing beverages and foods, it's the exact opposite scenarios to what I just described. Caffeine as a reinforcer makes us feel slightly better or a lot better in the immediate minutes and hours after we ingest it. So it's acting as a reinforcing agent, not just while you're under the effects of caffeine, but for the things that preceded the ingestion of caffeine, which is why you return again and again to caffeine containing beverages such as coffee and tea, or maybe even foods that contain caffeine, even if the taste of those foods is not something that you would otherwise consider especially delicious. In fact, most people, when they take their first sip of coffee or tea or other caffeine containing beverage, they find it to be very bitter. And that's not because of the taste of caffeine. It's because of the taste of the beverage itself, independent of caffeine. However, when 
caffeine is present in there, they come to prefer that taste over most all tastes. In fact, they will, as I mentioned earlier, will invest a lot of financial resources and time and energy to make sure that they get that beverage. What they're trying to make sure is not that they get that taste, but that they get the caffeine. It is that positively reinforcing. And the taste, therefore, takes on new significance, new meaning, and we come to associate it as positive. And in fact, most of us, including myself, love the taste of espresso, love the taste of coffee, love the taste of yerba mate. Even if the initial taste, the very first time that we consume that beverage was either neutral or negative. And that is all because of the reinforcing properties of caffeine. Now, caffeine is a bit of a complicated one. I talked about this on a podcast long ago, but I'll just remind you that it turns out that if you are caffeine adapted, in other words, if you are used to drinking caffeine, then the ingestion of caffeine most often will cause vasodilation. It will actually allow more blood flow through. However, if you are not caffeine adapted, it will cause vasoconstriction due to an increased stress response. So if you're familiar with caffeine, caffeine can actually have a little bit more of a relaxation response. Although if you drink enough of it, it will make you amped up. 